I bought every Oculus headset ever, but this video is about more than that. It's a story of a visionary who saw a future no one else could, and how that vision got him kicked out of the company he created. This is every Oculus headset ever. In 2011, VR headsets were expensive and barely supported. After decades of VR flops, it seemed VR would remain a science fiction dream. But then, in a cluttered trailer filled with computer screens and circuit boards, a young man's face lights up as he successfully runs a VR demo. That man was Palmer Lucky. He believed that VR had the potential to revolutionize the way people interact with computers and each other. All the while globally, the number of humans interested in VR was in the hundreds. Palmer would collect VR headsets and tear them apart to see how they worked. And one one night, he found a Boom 3C on eBay. In the 90s, they were created by Mark Bolas and costed over $90,000. He managed to get one on eBay for less than $100. He emailed Bolas and ended up getting a job at his VR lab at USC. Palmer loved working at the lab and he really began to believe VR was the future and he was quoted saying, the matrix is so much closer than we think. After three years and over 50 prototypes, he created one he was ready to share with the world. He called it the PR6, but later changed the name to Rift, meaning that the HMD creates a rift between the real world and the virtual world. Unfortunately though, things started going a bit south for Palmer at this point. Bolas told him he would need to find a new job soon because the ICT lab just didn't have the budget and would usually let employers go after six months. After job rejections, he was considering finishing his journalism degree, but missed his uni enrollment window. But then, when all hope was lost, Palmer received a message from one of his childhood heroes that changed the course of history forever. John Carmack, a pioneer of the first person shooter and 3D game engines. After a few exchanges, Carmack ended up borrowing one of Palmer's prototypes and was blown away. He started porting Doom to work with it and went on to demo the headset at E3. It led to a lot of interest from some really big companies like Valve and Sony and Brendan Arab, a tech entrepreneur, ended up getting into contact with Palmer. The two had a meeting and Palmer wanted to just do Oculus himself. He would just have some friends over and build a couple hundred headsets from the Kickstarter thinking nothing more would come of it. Brendan Arp convinced him just how big it could be, stating it's going to be so much bigger, trust me. Palmer through Arab saw the potential and they decided to partner up. And the company Oculus was founded in July 2012. Arab had the idea to get as many professional testimonials to add credibility to the project and to create a developer kit that would lead to a consumer version to make sure hype doesn't get out of control. Arab went traveling around the world to find people to hire and ended up with an incredible team of developers. He also created a partnership with Epic Games and Unity to get an SDK for the DK1 and some testimonials. While showing Epic Games, Cliff Blazinski saw a demo and his mind was so blown he couldn't even finish the demo. He wanted to invest 100k. They met with Valve as well, who were super negative about VR and couldn't see past the problems. Newell thought it was cool but had a lot of questions about the feasibility. Palmer asked if Valve could have a Steam VR section, which they absolutely refused. Arab asked if Valve could make a testimonial video, which they said they would need to think about. They ended up recording one and sending it to the Oculus team. John Carmack's relationship with Zenimax was deteriorating rapidly, as the company demanded an exorbitant amount of money for the rights to release Doom on the DK1. But Valve jumped in to save the day and started porting their games. Valve then fired a range of AR team members, so Oculus were very worried that Valve would abandon the ports when push came to shove. Apparently there was an internal conflict at Valve for AR and VR, and it seemed VR won. And then in 2012, he launched a Kickstarter to fund the development of the Oculus Developer Kit 1. The campaign was a huge success, raising over $2.4 million. The night before release, the team was still working on the SDK. The Oculus team was divided over the decision to open source the DK1, with one half advocating for open sourcing it and the other half pushing it for it to remain closed for fear that other companies might steal it. They kept it private for the moment. And the DK1 released in March 2013 for 300 US dollars. It comes in this really strong box. We can crack it open. Meet the Oculus DK1. The face cushion's almost completely peeled off. It comes with a power cable, a cloth. I love the guide, it's just printed on A4 paper. The control box receives the head tracking data. It's got some ports and some buttons. There's three types of lenses. A is for normal vision, B for far sight, and C for near sight. They come on and off easily with a twist. And finally, a mini USB and HDMI cable. The DK1 has a seven inch display with a 640 by 800 pixels per eye resolution and a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. It has a 110 degree FOV. Keep in mind at the time, the best VR headset you 
could buy was the Z800 3D Visor Head Mounted Display by Imagine with a resolution of 800 by 600 and an FOV of 40 degrees, which had been described as looking through toilet paper rolls. To get it going, you just plug in the HDMI to your computer as well as a USB. A mini USB goes into the control box as well as the HDMI cable. And then you just have to plug the control box into a power outlet. Each eye sees a barrel distorted image which gets corrected by the lenses, creating a spherical mapped image for each eye. The DK1 uses a system of tracking called Inertial Measurement Unit, also known as IMU tracking, to determine the orientation of your head in 3D space. This system, which consists of magnometers, accelerometers, and gyroscopes, is called 3 degrees of freedom tracking, meaning you can't move your head freely in 3D space, only on the angles. The system over time was prone to drift, which could lead to less accurate tracking of the headset's orientation. As a result, the games and experiences are limited. Okay, so I've got the Oculus configuration utility here and we're going to jump in and see if we can get it working. I've got the control box here, it's all plugged in. And here we have the Oculus SDK. Oh, whoa. I'll tell you what, you can really notice the motion blur. If you move your head really quickly, it just blurs in the headset. Oh, we can press the space bar to get some diagnostics. I know T teleports you to the start. I gotta say, it looks pretty passable. There seems to be a lot of dead pixels on this unit though. The thing I noticed the most is the 3D really looks good. If you know me, you know how much I like Boneworks and Bone Lab, so this map is extremely familiar. The screen door effect is quite apparent, but you really stop noticing after a bit. The screens actually started fogging up as well. Yeah, it looks really good. It doesn't even feel like you're looking at a display. You just get lost in the world as soon as you start playing. Wow. That was actually really impressive. Oh, it's quite painful on the eyes. My eyes hurt really badly after just a quick session. You definitely couldn't do that for a long period of time. It's just burning and... I know what eye strain in VR is like, but that really was straining. I didn't get any motion sickness at all though. So Valve actually ported a whole range of Source games to work with the DK1. Foresight and Lagoid started with TF2. There were a range of challenges as they wanted to port an FPS and at the time it had an active developer team of 20 people shipping updates every two weeks. While making it, the challenges fell into five key areas. The first one was the latency between pressing buttons and the second was stereoscopic rendering. What needs to be drawn on screen to generate 360 degree images in the source engine. They also had to work out what a VR UI is, how to show game menus like welcome and pause, status bars, aiming and crosshairs. And then they had to work out how to implement head tracking so it was natural and familiar while reducing motion sickness as much as possible. Interestingly, Palmer knew that VR motion sickness would go away with training. He compared it to flight training and how the pilots need to get used to the sickness. Wow, this looks really good. Bearable. It's not a bad experience doing this. If the headset wasn't so uncomfortable, I would rather play it like this. 3D just makes games look so much better. Yeah, Whoa. Is. Looks so good in VR. It's all in 3D. Ow. You can really increase the FOV if you bring the slider towards you, but the eye strain goes up. I think I'd rather have it at the max setting. It'd be hard to play it again normally after playing it in VR. All the details are just so much clearer. The walls are really flat and the floor's just flat. You really notice those things in VR. Oh, I'm sorry. It was really cool. I could see myself wanting to play it in VR and not just normally play it. It really quite blew my mind. Valve ported a range of their Source games into VR. I loved the DK1. However, there were those that were more skeptical. They pointed out that the technology was still in its early stages, expensive, and required a powerful computer to run. There was also a discussion about the potential negative impacts it could have on society, with some arguing that it could further isolate people and disconnect them from the real world. Despite these criticisms, the Oculus DK1 received overwhelmingly positive reviews from critics and developers. When it came out, it was such a success they were selling on eBay for over $1,000. It was a major milestone in the world of VR and to me represented a gateway into another world that transcended the boundaries of our physical selves and explored the digital realm. I was no longer playing a game, but existing inside it. Its entire source code was released to the public in September 2014, including the firmware, schematics, and mechanics. This helped pave the way for future developments of VR technology. Palmer seemed genuinely interested in making sure VR didn't die out this time and just wanted to see it succeed. Then Mark Zuckerberg came into the picture. It all started with him trying to hire someone to build a Facebook phone in the early mobile phone war days, but he completely missed the phone computing platform wave and he knew it. As Android and Apple took over the market, Zuck knew VR was the next platform and this time he wasn't going to miss it. Then in March 2014, 
when Facebook purchased Oculus for $2.4 billion. The Oculus team thought Facebook had the money and resources to make sure VR doesn't die out this time. To say that the Oculus team and community were directly opposed to Facebook would be an understatement. When Zuck came to visit the Oculus office, one of the team members had a cigarette packet with a Facebook logo on it, as a poster hanging on the wall. While it's easy to criticize Facebook, I can't help but feel happiness that Zuck saw a future in VR when only enthusiasts did. No other company at the time was willing to bet big on it like he was. Around this time, Oculus VR was sued by Zenimax Media, the parent company of the game developer ID Software. The lawsuit alleged that Zenimax's former employee and Oculus CTO John Carmack stole trade secrets to develop their Rift headset. Zenimax, in my opinion, is a terrible company. The more I look into the case, the more I form a negative opinion of them. It's not a stretch to say Carmack isn't a big fan of them either. Then, in July 2014, Oculus released the DK2 for 350 US dollars. The DK2 was shipped in a cardboard box. When we open it, we're greeted with the instruction manual. It walks us through the process of setting it up and has some warnings in it. A camera for tracking the headset. And of course, the actual HMD. Just by holding it, you can tell it's a massive design upgrade from the DK1. This dial on the side lets you change how close the display is to your face. The HMD just goes to a USB and display port cable. And this tiny little box. We also have a spare pair of lenses, a mini USB cable, a cloth, and international power plugs. It featured a high resolution display with a resolution of 960 by 1080 per eye. It's just ripped straight from the Galaxy Note 3, which has a low persistence OLED with a refresh rate of 75 hertz and a field of view of 100 degrees. But the reason there was a DK2 was for its positional tracking system. Via this infrared camera, which tracks you around the room, meaning you can move in the game world. It's called six degrees of freedom movement. To get it working, you need to plug a HDMI and USB cable into the front of the headset and plug the back of those cables into the computer. We then have to plug in an AUX and a mini USB into the IR camera, which plugs into the computer and the box on the back. The box on the back also needs to be plugged into a power outlet. There are quite a few games and experiences for the DK2. <laughs> I've got this IR camera and I'm just gonna treat it like a webcam. It's plugged into too many things. So we'll just pop it down in front of us. Oh. All right, it is currently in a very secure location on top of some Xbox 360 discs. My mic actually picks up the interference. Listen to this. Classic. Yeah, I found it's from this cable plugging into the camera. I've got the DK2 up and running. It actually uses the same app as the DK1, so it's really easy to set up. Wow. So you can move your head completely freely with the six stuff tracking. It gives you a whole new appreciation for the world. It really brings you into it. One thing I'm noticing is the IPD is just not correct for me. My right eye is blurry or my left eye is blurry. It's a choice between those. We can turn on the tracker bounds, which will actually show us what the IR blaster in front of me is mapping out. It's pretty cool how far I can actually move my head. So I can go all the way around and it stays in the frame. So this is the six degrees of freedom tracking. Compared to the, just the angular on the DK1, you can actually move around the world. Thing You just want to grab things with your hands. That's the, all I can think of. I just want to grab that, but my hands aren't in the world, which kind of trips you out. Now let's jump into some other demos. I got to say, I'm really noticing the build quality is a lot better. It feels much stronger and I'm a big fan of this plastic chassis. It just works. I want to jump into Tuscany to test out the six off and see what a difference it makes. It just looks so much better. Motion blur is gone. It just seems like a solved issue at this point. No matter how fast I move around, my head just keeps up. And the colors look much more vibrant and brighter and you can really see the resolution increase. It's absolutely amazing. We can bump up the debug stats. Go back to the start. Yeah, I'm glad they moved to six degrees of freedom move. So just as an example of that, you can see the headsets tracking in the game and I can actually move around things rather than just be stuck looking forward at them. Pretty cool. Now, I really wanted to jump into Half-Life 2 to check it out and see what a difference it makes. So you can actually move around the G-Man. Uh, it looks so much better on this headset. Just the display, the resolution, the colors look better, just everything. Absolutely incredible. You really notice how the walls are flat. So I've managed to get it working with Steam VR, which opens up our Steam VR library. It is super glitched out. I'm sure there's a way to fix it. It's cool seeing these games I'd usually play just normally. It looks fine. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's not that bad. Let's jump into one of these worlds and see what we find. You can really start to feel that it's a developer kit when you try and do anything. A lot of the demos aren't available on Oculus anymore. So you have to scram around trying to find downloads and trying to get things working. Most things by default just don't work. 
That's the problem I'm running into. See, this looks pretty good. It's bearable. Winter company. See, I can read that even though I'm pretty far away. That text on the right up there, no chance. The thing that's striking me the most are the black levels. They look really good. They're dark and they're black. I've to all my Quest 2 and Pro. This seems to have more color depth. Hello. Oh, it's, so it's weird when you don't have hands. You just want to wave and do everything. I'm on a DK2. Hello. Whoa. Whoa. This looks so good. Oh wait, we can actually move our player around by doing that. So you can really see six degrees of freedom movement. I can adjust the way I'm looking at things. This is so cool, I can't believe it. It looks so good. I remember when I first heard about VR in 2013, I thought it was a massive gimmick. I just thought you got a big screen display on a headset. I didn't realize it was actually 3D like this. And if I could go back in time 2014, I would have just bought this immediately. It is like nothing you could have ever gotten at the time. And the FOV is massive. It's like you're there. It definitely feels bigger than the Quest Pro's FOV. And the colors, they just pop. Anyway, I think that's enough of this game, but that was a lot of fun. Wow, it took me about three or four hours to get that working, but we got there in the end. Wow, that was actually really fun. In the spirit of leaving no stone unturned, we're gonna try and run Boneworks. Oh wow, it works. So most VR experiences seem to actually run on the DK2. It's just that because it doesn't have controllers. But yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised. If it just had some controllers, it would be pretty usable. And I just can't believe the color vibrancy when you're in the headset is amazing. The colors just pop and the black levels are amazing. But I guess that's what you get with an OLED panel. This thing is really cool. I'm impressed. You can really start to see VR starting to form. At this point, Palmer had a lot of ideas for accessories that could be used, like gun stocks and treadmills. At the time, he was heavily focused on developing a wand system so you could track your hands in VR. Palmer had a problem. He needed panels for his headsets, but manufacturers aren't interested in creating such a small amount of them. They're used to fulfilling massive phone orders. Lucky ended up in a meeting with Samsung and he showed them a prototype of the Oculus Rift. They were extremely impressed. Samsung gave a demonstration of their phone VR prototypes, but they were absolutely absolutely terrible. Samsung agreed to help Oculus with their panel issue on the DK2 if Oculus would lead their mobile VR. First announced in September 2014 and the first consumer version of the headset was released in late 2015. The Gear VR comes in this small box. I've used a lot of cheap mobile VR systems so I was very surprised at how high quality it was. It has a lightweight design and a built-in accelerometer and gyroscope for tracking your head movements. You can pop open the top and put your phone in. The lenses are so clear some people will take them out and put them into their HTC Vives. It comes with this very simple type controller and of course a user manual and some adapters. Notice the emphasis on powered by Oculus. Over the years Samsung released several versions of the Gear VR which does not warrant a big enough difference for me to review each of them but alas each had its own set of features and improvements. The 2017 version was the first to include a handheld controller which allowed users to interact with VR content more naturally. They released the headset yearly until 2019. The games and experiences are extremely limited but surprisingly cool. There's a whole app store for Gear VR. Most people I know just used it for three 3D videos, if you know what I mean. All right, now I've got the Gear VR and let's test it out. So let's pop it open. Whoop. There we go. We can see the lenses in here. Oh, it flips me upside down. So I've got a very old Samsung Galaxy S7. And when you plug it in, it automatically then knows it's in VR mode. And we just had to download an app and the app's downloaded now. So there's a wheel on the top to adjust the way it looks with your eyes. Now it looks really good, wow. It's quite surprising. It really reminds me of the DK1 once you're in here. And the UI, it's very similar to the Quest's UI. So you can just tap on the right side of the headset to press things or you can also tap on the left if you change that in the setting. So let's turn on pass through here and you can see my recording setup. That's me on the monitor, hello. And it is actually quite weird how this works. You can see my hands. There's a light up there and there's a light up there. Pretty bizarre that we have full pass through just even on such old hardware. It's using the camera on the front of the headset so we can even block it there. But yeah, how cool is that? So I set up a controller, just hold the home button and then it syncs to the headset. So click the back button and then we have the controller. So we can reset the controller's orientation by holding the home button. Wow, it's really good. It works pretty well. Oh, so you just tilt the controller to move the character. Yeah, this works too well almost. Yeah, and you can move all the way around. So there's a whole game store. It looks very much just like the Quest. It actually tracks where your hand is on this trackpad on the controller. Temple Run. Let's jump into Firefight and see what this game's all about. Well, we download Asteroids. Okay, just a classic loading screen. I've got a red mark starting to develop already, but it's not that uncomfortable. And my eyes aren't strained nearly as much as I'd say the DK1. I have to say the 3D looks pretty good, but the not having six degrees of freedom movement does hold you back, especially if you're used to it. 
pretty cool, right? I mean, it's not that bad, like... Yeah, we've got him. I'm starting to feel quite a bit of eye strain. So this must be some sort of 3D video app. With 3 off movement, I don't really like 3D movies. It's like, sure, you can look around, but there isn't really a 3D effect and the scale just seems way off. So it looks like you can create parties and play games with others. So one really cool thing you can do with Gear VR is web XR experiences. So we don't have to just rely on the app store. We can play some of these web games. So you just have to click allow in the browser and we can jump into any web VR experience on the internet. So we just have to hit that allow button and we can jump in. I feel like web XR experiences really go under the radar and not many people know about them, but I'm sure we'll be looking at a lot more when we try out the Oculus Go. But yeah, overall that's the Gear VR. I'm pretty impressed. The lenses I noticed were especially clear. Overall, it's pretty good. I mean, it's not that bad. You can definitely see the potential of Gear VR, but unfortunately it just wasn't meant to be. The eye strain is real and three degrees of freedom movement just really isn't gonna cut it. There aren't any sort of in-depth VR experiences you can get without that ability to move around. And look at that red mark I have on my head, holy moly. Despite the success of Gear VR, Samsung ultimately decided to discontinue the product line in 2020 to focus on other areas of its business. However, the Gear VR remains popular and influential product for the history of VR. There's a lot of games you can play, and honestly they aren't that bad considering how cheap Gear VR headsets are. Carmack was developing a proper inside-out tracking system for Gear VR at one point, where they built a whole operational system with proper controllers and inside-out tracking. The Quest is basically an Android phone, which makes me wonder if there is a version of Gear VR that took off. I guess we'll never know. And I do think that we missed an opportunity here. Uh, you know, I invested a whole lot of effort into it, and it's, it's the foundation that we've built all the mobile things off of, but you know, looking back, it's clear that we had huge unit volume, and it had good reviews. People liked it, but it was not retentive. I mean, the retention we have, you know, Quest up here, Rift S, Rift, Go, and then Gear VR is way lower. Everything up until this point was leading to the Oculus Rift, which came out in March 2016. The Oculus Rift varies depending on the specific version of the headset. The original came with one tracker and a controller and had limited experiences for $599. US In addition, Oculus went on to release a version with the Oculus Touch controllers in December 2016. And in the box, it came with two sensors instead of one. You could also buy a third sensor for an even better experience. The guy I bought it off had one. The box is huge. Turning it around, we can see the emphasis on content. We can slide it open and then jump in. And we have the revolutionary Oculus Touch controllers. Having the rings on the back feels amazing. The IR cameras to track your headset. They're super sleek and low profile. I love how you can screw off the top. It makes it easy to mount to the corner of your walls. It's a shame you can't use them with your Quest for a better PC VR experience. And a second sensor for optimal tracking. And finally, the CV1 headset. It has a dual OLED display with a 1080 by 1200 resolution per eye and a refresh rate of 90 Hertz with a field of view of 110 degrees. The fabric is so gross. I don't know why they thought this would be a good Good idea. The built-in speakers are a great addition. It's amazing to see an IPD slider. When holding it, it feels really light. We've got some booklets to ignore and a microfiber cloth. This is a screwdriver to remove the headsets from their strap. You plug the headset into your computer via a HDMI and USB port, and a cable at the other end goes into the headset. We then just have to plug in the first sensor and place it somewhere in our room, and then do the same thing for our second sensor. This is what the microphone sounds like on the CV-1. Hopefully it's passable. Okay, it feels pretty comfortable and secure on my head, so that's a plus. So Lone Echo is one of my favorite games of all time. I really like the field of view, very close to the display. You can see the corners of the display when it's on. I prefer when it's just a circle. It just seems more natural. Wow, it looks really good. The colors, it's like no compression. It feels really comfortable and it's very light. I can really notice already because I'm used to playing on my Quest and no compression in the game looks amazing. There's no artifacting, you're just in the world. You can definitely see a screen door effect. I've got to say the audio sounds really good as well. It's really clear. I find the fabric just itchy. Mm, we're gonna make it? Yes. The controllers feel really good in your hand and the tracking, it tracks you everywhere with the sensors I've got set up around the room. I forgot how good the graphics were in this game. Yes, I want out of here right now. Thank you. If you haven't played this game and you own a VR headset, play it. It's just bizarre. Like, what, I don't understand why everybody didn't want to buy one of these when it came out. It's just it's better than any 2D game you could ever play. Okay, now we can jump into Boneworks. 
Yeah, it, it, you can really see the screen door effect when you look at things in the distance. Text just gets harder and harder to read. You can still have fun. The controllers feel really clicky. They're very tactical and you can feel the responses. As well, you might be able to notice. So if I turn around, it'll track my controller behind me perfectly, even though it's behind my back, which does not happen on the inside out tracking system. Well, except the Quest Pro. This feels really good. The particle effects, it especially also becomes apparent in the low resolution display. But the depth is perfect. It's good enough for most VR experiences. So if you're buying a VR headset in 2020, you can get a really good deal on the original CV1. And the tracking is better than on things like the Quest, so I will say it's significantly more annoying to get it working. Things just don't work. But wow, the colors look amazing as well. You can really see the black levels and the, the shading and just all looks absolutely beautiful. Yeah, wow. Got the utility gun out. I loved it's just no latency. That's the best part. Dying no, man. The headset also feels quite light on your head, but that said, I am struggling to get it in the comfortable position. It's not just sort of set and forget. It just, I feel like with the strap, there's no way to get it on your head, so it's just perfect. That said, these audio flaps are really cool and they work really well. When I push the headset a bit further away from my face, you get that circle effect. And when you bring it closer, it's a rectangle with rounded edges. When it's circular, kind of like toilet paper rolls, it's much more immersive. It feels like you're really there, whereas when you see the grid, it really I can really notice those squares in the corners of my vision. But yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised at how usable this is. It took probably about an hour to set up, but once you're in the headset and get it working, it's amazing. One thing I found quite annoying is you have to actually use the computer for most things. You can't do it in the headset, I found. And when I've got the sensors here and here and somewhere over there, it makes it so you have to walk towards your computer every time. I mean, it's a small issue, and I guess once you get everything right, it's perfect, but it's little issues like that that I find annoying. I also love the IPD slider. I never accidentally switched it. It kind of just works. You set it in position and it works perfectly. I, I still think the fabric is gross. Maybe if it was like le fake leather or something, just the way it is now. If I scratch it, I can feel the dust and grime. It's just not a, a vibe. And the controllers are absolutely incredible. The way the rings are on the outside of the controller works perfectly. When you let go, it secures your hand. So if you can see there, I let go of the controller and it stays in my hand. I don't really need these straps at the bottom. And it almost protects your hands from hitting things as well. And with these trackers, I mean, I guess from this point on, for a while at least, we're going to be stepping backward. The tracking for each generation is going to get worse for a bit until it finally gets better later on in the video. But wow, I'm presently surprised. It's a really good headset. CV1 was generally well received when it was released in 2016. It was praised for its high quality display, comfortable design, wide range of available content. The controllers are so beautiful and feel so natural in your hands. I love them. However, it was also criticized for its high price and the need for a powerful computer to run it. At the time, HTC Vive was seen as a better overall option. It's crazy how the CV1 in so many ways is better than the headsets they would go on to make. It tracked you perfectly all around your body. When you moved to a sensorless system, the tracking got significantly worse. The headset was also extremely light. The Rift marked a pivotal point for Oculus. There were now high quality VR games you could play. At the time, Palm was intrigued by the Trump campaign and planned to donate to an organization called Nimble America to fund anti-Hillary Clinton memes on billboards. With the support of the Donald subreddit, Milo Yiannopoulos became involved with the organization and Nimble America wanted to demonstrate their backing from a member of the elite. Yiannopoulos connected Palmer with Gideon Resnick, a journalist from the Daily Beast who promised Palmer anonymity. Well, they confirmed in writing that it would be off the record. Despite his beliefs in journalistic ethics and trust in Resnick, Resnick published a damaging article on September 22nd, 2016, portraying Palmer as funding a racist and sexist white supremacist organization. There was a lot of backlash from this article. Here's yeah. what happened. I gave $9,000 to a group that ran a single anti-Hillary Clinton billboard. That was actually the extent of it. And then a huge number of people in the tech influencer space, the social media talking heads and media, they started saying Palmer Lucky was funding uh, people who are attacking Hillary Clinton supporters online. Uh, there were a lot of people who I think were looking for a scapegoat to kind of be the right wing reaction to correct the record, which actually was paying people to attack why Trump supporters. Why Facebook then informed Palmer that he would have to resign the next day, but Palmer refused and Facebook withdrew the threat. However, Palmer was compelled to release a statement directly from Mark Zuckerberg, which went against his personal beliefs. The thought of being kicked out of Oculus was terrifying for Palmer. From this point on, he was completely exiled from the company. Well, I mean, I was explicitly told after the election you can come back to the office. Yeah. Like we're gonna like we're just gonna let this blow over. Um, and but you're you're right. It's because Trump won 
they decided that strategy was non-viable. And finally, in March 2017, Palmer was forced out of Facebook. If one were to argue from Facebook's perspective, they might say that regardless of Palmer's intentions, as the head of Oculus, his actions could have serious implications and create a public relations disaster for the company. Why did Zuck fire you? Oh, no, Zuck didn't fire me. He's way Why did all. Facebook fire you? There's a lot of reasons. I always had good performance reviews. Uh, but what it, <laughs> what, but, 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 uh, it was clear that there were a lot of people in the media and in the tech industry who were going to continue attacking me. We, we hoped it would blow over, but they kept attacking me for months and months and months and months. I was put on leave for six months. I don't know if you know that. Uh, Sorry, I this on... is all on the heels of this one political donation. Correct. $9,000. Yes. And so on the heels of that, the hope was that it would go away. Now, I think, here's, here's the real problem. I think if Trump had lost, people could have said, oh, well, you know, he's just one of those eccentrics, impact, no impact. He's a loser. He's a yeah, he, you, yeah. lo loser, but whatever. Uh, Trump winning is, I think, what made it so untenable. Because people continued to attack me, not for the, the $9,000 the $9, donation was the reason you were fired, just for, uh, just for supporting Trump. Mm as you know, these things are very complex, but more or less, yes. I mean, like, there's, there's, I will, a direct, there's a direct causal line from that to me being put on leave, to me not being allowed to come back and then pushed out. Andrew Bosworth, he ran ads at Facebook for 14 years. He was put in after my departure as the head of Oculus. And he was the guy who was putting things on social media like, I think the exact wording was, if you support Donald Trump because you don't like Hillary Clinton, you are a shitty human being. And he's the person who's allowed to lead Oculus now. So it's, it's not a problem of being aggressive. It's being on the right side. It's being on the right side of yeah. the politics. The situation was handled, made it much harder for me to start a new company and to get started again. You know, like ba basically the, the fact that all these stories have been allowed to go uncorrected for the better part of a year, uh, more or less cemented them as truth, which is why to this day, you still have press repeating those same claims, which are just, it, 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 they're, they're obviously false, but if you put in no effort, then it's easy to re-report them. Pretty incredible that I've spent hundreds of hours of my life, maybe thousands, dealing with a $9,000 donation crazy, that I made, right? honestly, without putting that much thought into it. I don't want to sound like a rich guy here, but I had just sold my company for billions of dollars. This was a relatively small donation to a relatively innocuous cause. It was one billboard in Pittsburgh that had Hillary and the word too big to jail. It's incredible how that was turned into like this defining thing that has to be addressed every single time anyone does a story about me. In the wake of being kicked out of Oculus, he sought to create a new company and brainstormed a range of problems he wanted to solve. I have to do something that is gonna matter. I have to do something where people say, wow, Palmer did it again. Three areas I thought about starting a company in. One was working in the national security space, considered starting a nonprofit private prison company that could outcompete all of the publicly traded private prison companies. And then the last one was petroleum-based food products. I think the only way to solve obesity in America is to allow anybody to eat as much as they want of anything with no self-control or changes to their physical activity whatsoever. It has to be the holy grail. It's an opportunity and also a big problem. The problems were the major defense primes in the United States, Lockheed, Northrop, Raytheon, were not equipped with the talent and incentives they needed to build autonomous systems. Uh, the, the core technologies like sensor fusion and mesh networking, uh, they, they were not equipped to build the systems that I thought were going to define the future of warfare and deterrence. The best AI experts in the world are not inside defense companies. They are inside of companies like Facebook, like Google. Like, actually, I've lost people to Snapchat who are excellent. They genuinely have one of the best computer vision teams in the world. People laugh because they think it's just a funny, you know, social media mustache emoji AR overlay app. But they have excellent technologists. But all those excellent technologists are working on problems that I don't think matter all that much. Advertising optimization, getting a little bit more engagement in the photo applications. So I decided I was going to work in the national security space because that was an area where I do have a lot of technical talent. I can hire people to work in it. I can make a lot of money and do something successful with it. And if I'm able to actually accomplish my goals there, I'll still be very, very happy with myself. Palmer then found an Android in 2017. Aragorn. Uh, Narsil reforged the flame of the West. Anderol has since achieved incredible success and is currently valued at an impressive $8.5 billion. We see ourselves as kind of defending Western ideals and values. This idea of a liberal democracy with strong checks and balances and democracy. And we think that stands in stark contrast with some of our adversaries. We are trying to protect 
the United States and its allies that believe in those values against people who do not value those things, against people who don't really care about human rights, who don't care about privacy, who do not care about strong rule of law and a strong democracy. Um, and so we felt that Aragorn's sword, Andriel, the Flame of the West, was a pretty, pretty good thing to model ourselves after. We're selling to the government for a small fraction of the price of competing systems and performing better, and we still make more money both in terms of absolute amount and percentage because we are able to build cheaper systems that are still higher margin. Palmer seems like a genuinely awesome guy and I'm happy to see him out there in the world succeeding. But without him, the future of VR is uncertain. What's Facebook's plan for Oculus without Palmer? Facebook then went on with a new plan. They would make three devices and whichever was the most successful, they would put 100% of their focus to it. The first result of this was the Oculus Go, which was released in May 2018. The controllers are tiny and simple. Here's the actual headset. Unfortunately, no IPD adjustment on these. The buttons are all clicky. We also have the straps to attach it to your face. And finally, the charger with an adapter to use in Australia. It features a resolution of 1280 by 1440 pixels per eye with a refresh rate of 60 to 72 hertz. And speakers and a microphone are built in. It also has a Qualcomm Snapdragon 821 processor and 32 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes of storage. It does not require a PC or mobile phone to operate. It's powered by a built-in battery that lasts for around two hours of active use. The device uses three degrees degrees of freedom for head tracking, just like the DK1. It's a great device for VR entertainment and social VR experiences, but it's quite limited. To get it going, you just have to put it on and then do some light setup in the mobile app. Okay, now we're on the Oculus Go. It reminds me so much of the Samsung Gear VR. There's this one overarching issue I'm having where Facebook keep forcing you to have an account the more and more we go down the headset cycle. For example, if I record a video on my Go, it wouldn't let me view the video unless I logged in with Facebook, but I do that via the app. But if I log in via the app then it just sends me through a login loop i just want to use this product and record but they just seem to get in the way every time the first thing i want to jump into is this game called republic vr it's pretty highly rated so and it's free and if it's free it's for me the headset is noticeably comfortable the top strap feels good and it's nice oh wow for three degrees of freedom movement you kind of have to stay still to enjoy the experience fully and the controller is just extremely limited it's pretty cool in my inventory my passport oh the special effects look amazing i must say yeah. You can see it tracks where your thing is and it's got a full working thumb pad, so it's pretty cool. Oh, you can skip dialogue, I like that. We're back on the phone. I wonder what the limit of the Oculus Go is, where you can push it to. From what I'm seeing now, it's really cool, but it's basically just Gear VR with more Facebook. Dwight Schultz. Apparently the total time to beat this game is eight hours, which is pretty long for an Oculus Go game. Okay, that was really cool, but I'm keen to jump onto the next one, so... So this is the YouTube app. I've seen it on Quest. Yeah, 3D videos never quite work for me, but I mean, it's kind of cool. Oh, we have hands. Cool. In VR, you really reach this limit of just people talking in 3D and the novelty goes away so fast. And I just want to jump into the actual action. I don't want to just listen to someone talk. I feel so good having a gun, finally. This is really cool. All right, yeah, we'll skip the tutorial. Thank you very much. All right, here we go. Oh, oh my gosh. This is really fun. <laughs> How do you... Uh, the headshot's better than foot shots, yeah. This would be fun on an airplane, I think. Uh, it just seems like Gear VR. Better in some ways, worse in some ways. If you think about it, and this is just the DK1, just standalone, but a lot more kinks worked out. Oh, it's actually getting harder. It's actually take that one. And my hand's getting a bit sore now. Oh, whoa. Oh, it looks so cool. It's just an interactive experience, wow. Looks amazing. And if you get in VR, you can look all around. And it really does look amazing, the rain effects as well. And you also have access to a complete web browser for web XR experiences and just general browsing. The resolution isn't gonna do it for me. You can really notice, especially on the text, you can really see the pixels, but I mean, it isn't that bad. I'm left thinking it's cool, but I don't know if I'd ever wanna use it again. You can see I've got a red mark as well. It was a little bit painful, but it's over now. It got generally positive reviews from critics. It's great that you don't need a PC to use it. The design is sleek and it was at an affordable price, making it accessible to a wider range of people than some other virtual reality headsets on the market. The display is also high resolution and has super clear images. It's comfortable and easy to use. However, the three degrees of freedom head tracking and the single controller limit the type of experiences that are possible and the battery life is miserable. The speakers aren't the best either. You can't do much with it except use it as a basic 
basic media device and play some games. Maybe it would be worth it if the resolution was higher and it could provide a better experience than a laptop or TV. Shortly after the GOES release, the Oculus and ZeniMax lawsuit was resolved, with a ruling in favour of Facebook and Oculus. The jury found that Oculus did not steal any trade secrets but did award ZeniMax a significant financial settlement for copyright infringement and breach of contract. The exact details of the settlement have not been publicly disclosed. Then in May 2019, we got the Oculus Quest. It comes with these newly designed controllers with the rings on the top. They're made to be used with the new inside out tracking system and the headset. The extremely gross fabric is back. It's good to have an IPD slider again. There's a headphone jack on both sides. And finally, a booklet, a charger, and a glasses spacer. The Quest features a Qualcomm Snapdragon 835 processor with four gigabytes of RAM and storage options of 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes. It also has a resolution of 1440 by 1600 pixels per eye and a 72 hertz refresh rate, and features a good IPD adjustment. The Quest also has a battery life of around two to three hours of continuous use. This is the first true standalone VR experience, and it was an affordable option. It was revolutionary at the time. Okay, and first impression, it's good to be wireless. I mean, we were for the Gear VR, but this is better. And the six degrees of improvement. The Quest is noticeably uncomfortable. I'm I loved with the Quest, you just turn it on and it works. I was having a lot of problems with the CV1 where you had to change things and constantly go to your computer, but with the Quest, you just turn it on and you're playing a game almost instantly. I was experiencing a glitch where it kept telling me my IPD was changing on the screen. I could really notice there was a haze and glare around the lights. You can unfortunately still see the screen door effect. It felt uncomfortable and a lot heavier. I know I would prefer a halo strap. The more you play, the more you completely forget about the screen door effect and don't notice it. I can really appreciate shade as well, this is better than almost all DK2 experiences and it's running standalone. I'm a massive Star Wars fan, so when I first played this game, it was so cool being able to have a lightsaber. The fabric, especially on a secondhand headset, is just gross. It does not age well. Alright, let's jump into some Beat Saber. I didn't want to get a copyright strike on this. It's pretty cool, it just runs completely standalone on the headset. VR's come a long way to get to this point. So one of the coolest things about the Quest is they introduced hand tracking. Previously you would need things like this leap motion attachment and this just worked. Apps by default. So good having your hands in VR, I must say. Yeah, it looks really good. And it's tracking you very well. That was one of the best things about the Quest. There's just so many updates. Good to have six degrees of freedom of movement tracking. And that's the Quest 1. You can use your full PC VR library as well. Let's jump into Lone Echo. Feels so good oh, being wireless. Yeah. You we can just spin all the way around as many times as we want. I can't help but notice some slight compression, but it's not as bad as I remember it. I definitely prefer this to the CV1. The FOV is also really good. You can bring it closer to your face, but yeah. I can see a lot of compression far away. Things far away look like a fully encoded video. But being wireless is especially important for a game like Lone Echo. Yeah, I'm impressed. I'm not sure if, I think I might prefer to, to play it on the DK1 just because of the compression and the artifacting far away. But I'm not noticing any input lag. Maybe a tiny amount, but not enough to stop me playing. It's just when you look in a distance, you can still see the screen door effect, which is a pain. But yeah, I'm pretty impressed so far. The Quest is estimated to have sold over 1 million units. It's just amazing how good this device is. You don't even need a PC to use it. VR has come a long way to get here. That said, it's basically just an Android phone and is really underpowered. But at that point, I'm nitpicking. Facebook's goal was to get 1 billion users into VR, and this was a step towards that. At the same time as the Quest, the Rift S was released. Out of all the headsets, this was the hardest to get. The guy I bought it off didn't have the original box, so this will have to do. We have the same controllers as the Quest. It was created in partnership with Lenovo, which is why their logo is on the side. This was the first real VR headset I owned. It has this incredibly comfortable halo strap. I'm happy to see a bigger emphasis on plastics rather than fabric. The display was 1280 by 1440 resolution per eye with an 80 hertz refresh rate. It comes with a display port and USB 3.0 connector to your computer. It features inside out tracking with five cameras on the front of the headset. The audio has integrated speakers and a microphone. It weighs 571 grams. I plugged in the display port and the USB cable and it didn't work. I was just getting this error in the headset. And with some troubleshooting thanks to Reddit, I discovered it was because my USB ports didn't have enough power output. This can be fixed by adding a USB hub that takes external power. So I got a USB hub and plugged it into the power outlet and into the computer. And it works. It did create a slight hiss on the mic. 
It can be fixed pretty easily with NVIDIA Broadcast or in my editing software. To get it set up, you just put it on and draw an outline. So simple. Finally, we have the Oculus Rift S. It's really comfortable. It feels really good on my forehead. Everyone has their own preference, but I always found the forehead straps to be the most comfortable. Absolute classic. The batteries died on me while I was playing, so. And with a quick battery change, we're back in action. So you have to set your IPD manually in the Oculus app, and I think it just does it by software. So this was the original Oculus menu they made, but they've since abandoned it <laughs> just to focus on Quest. It's funny, I like this in a lot of ways. The way you resize windows is really cool, I thought. You can just pop them out and you can attach things. So you can see your desktop, which will just create an inception. And you can just touch the menu, which is pretty cool. So now if we jump into our Oculus home, this was one of my first experiences with Oculus. You can build your own apartment and visit other apartments. Do you imagine a world where these are all just Mark Zuckerberg's NFTs? Oh, we can broadcast to the TV. Oculus console. At this time in VR, people still thought that teleporting was the best movement option. And boy, were we wrong about that. There we go. I think we can actually resize it. Yeah, we can make it as big as we want. so cool and yeah no clip hands unless you're gripping which i think it's agreed upon in vr that you want solid hands you don't want them clipping through everything i wonder how many we could get wow well, they're actually 3d inside it's just so cool remember when i first played this my mind was just completely blown and it's still getting a similar effect it's just so cool oh i got it wow I remember when I first played Half-Life Alex, it just had such a big impact on me. There's this technology exhibit in Melbourne called Acme, and often they would have these weird technology exhibits. And this just reminds me of being at one of those, except I was at home and I could play it for as much as I wanted. You can really notice the screen door effect, especially far away, it just becomes more blobby and you can see the pixels. You can even up close, but it's less apparent. Let's crush this can. I felt like I was using billion dollar hardware that only the military uses that you could only use for two minutes except I had it in my home and I could play it for as long as I wanted. Yeah, it feels really good. Just everything's so detailed and beautiful. You can start to see the limitations of the resolution though. This game would look much better on the Quest 2. Whoa. And the way you can just pick things up and interact with them. And you can interact with everything. So these paint cans, I think you can actually... Yeah, you can break them. <laughs> There's light switches you can use. Just so much detail. Another one of my VR firsts was this game called Oculus First Contact. It is so cool. I think it's based on Ready Player One, but the caravan reminds me of when Palmer was in his caravan building the DK1. So let's turn our little robot pal on. And this is sort of built to be played in room scale so you can walk around. Oculus was so cool. The logo is cool. The brand is cool. Meta just seems so ugh. And I'm tripping on the cable already. Hello. How cute he is. Oh. Weirdly, I'm finding my neck is getting really sore on this headset, maybe because I've looked down so much. How cool is that? <laughs> hey, little guy. How are you? Oh. Be free. Thank you. Oh, we can get some musical instruments going. Gosh, this is so cool. I forgot how cool this app was. I find the headset comfortable, but my neck's getting a bit uncomfortable. And with each generation, we can see less and less of a screen door effect. And I thought it had the biggest screen door effect ever. But when I'm using it now, it seems completely fine. Maybe it's because I've been using the DK1 and 2. Every time I play this, it blows my mind. Why do people play 2D games when they could be playing stuff like this? I'll never understand. I, I really like the controllers as well. I think I prefer them to the Quest 2s. They're much smaller. But... See, when I have the C v1 going i think the tracking is way better but when i use this i never really think about the tracking and the setup is so much easier and i mean how often do you put your hand behind your back there's not really anything in this game you would need to do that for so the tracking is good enough for that yeah but it looks really good on the rift s far away is when you really see that screen door effect so like Olivia Rhodes from here, a screen door blob. But things up close, you don't even see the effect. And one of the games that basically started my career, Boneworks. Okay, you can really see the screen door effect far away. Those things over there, it just, it comes very obvious you're looking in the screen. I remember this back pocket never worked with these controllers. Yes, yeah, so if you look at my shadow there, it just cannot track my back. And the controllers, you don't really notice the rings. I still think I prefer the other design, just because they, they are on top and they're kind of annoying. But yeah, you can notice the resolution 
and it seems lower than what I'm used to. But yeah, it feels really good. Screen door effect is super. Oh yeah, I can really feel it now. Did I get the sword? That was a problem with the tracking on this. You'd put things in your inventory and they just wouldn't work. So you can't put them on top. You have to put them behind with the rings. I got it. But yeah, that's Boneworks. The Rift S feels really good, but you can start to notice the tracking limitations of the inside-out tracking, especially when you go to reach behind you. Some games it matters more than other games, and you can kind of get away with not worrying about it, but I need to mention it. The Rift S was my first real VR headset. It was pretty cool, but uh, you can really just see a screen door effect. It's amazing how little is in the box. You just plug it in and it works. There were plans at one point to make a Rift S2, but the project got cancelled. There was an internal conflict at the company. With some employees prioritizing the development of high-end VR systems, while others saw the Quest's accessibility as a major step forward for VR. This conflict reportedly led to the departure of some high-profile figures, including Brendan Aro. The debate reflected a larger conversation in the VR industry at the time over whether standalone or PC-based systems were the key to VR's future. Meta don't actually publish their VR unit sales, so it's extremely hard to estimate how many have sold. It's just assumed that Facebook saw the most potential in the Quest line. To me, it's obvious to see why. You can just put on a Quest and you're getting almost a full PC VR experience. It's just so much less headaches and so much less upfront cost. In September 2020, Facebook announced Oculus Quest the successor to the popular Quest. This announcement came at a time when the company was facing increasing scrutiny and criticism over its handling of user data and privacy. It didn't help that the headset requires a Facebook account to use, which raised a lot of concerns in the community. The move was seen as a way for Facebook to gather more data on its users and interactions with the device. The company defended the decision, saying it will allow for a more seamless and personalized experience. The Quest 2 was released on October 13th, 2020, and it quickly sold out. Most people attribute it to the current situation of quarantine at the time, people were looking for a new way to entertain themselves. It came with a headset, two touch controllers, a charging cable and adapter with two AA batteries for the controllers and a basic strap. And of course, those booklets we've come to love. It features an improved resolution and a faster processor with a lighter design compared to its predecessor, the Quest. The Quest 2 has a resolution of 1832 by 1920 pixels per eye, which is 50% more pixels than the original Quest. It also has a fast switch LCD display with a refresh rate of 90 hertz, which can go up to 120 hertz. It's powered by a Qualcomm Snapdragon on the XR2 platform, which provides significant improvements in performance and power efficiency. The device also has six gigabytes of RAM and is available in three storage options. Other features include built-in speakers and a microphone and the ability to connect it to a PC for access to your full library of Oculus PC VR games and experiences, which is what I mainly used it for. A lot of people didn't like there were only three locked IPD settings. It has the same setup as the OG Quest, just set a border up and link your Facebook slash Meta account and you're in. The Quest 2 has a massive amount of games to play and of course you can just connect it to your PC for a full PC VR game. Let's jump into Bone Lab on the Quest 2. It was very common for people to change their straps because the base one is just unusable, at least for me. Oh, you can actually see it loses tracking next to my face. It feels a lot better than the Quest 1, especially because it's got that hard plastic cover. It's less gross. And I've spent over a thousand hours in this and, and it still feels almost brand new. And even though this has three clicks for your IPD, to be honest, for me, it was fine. I didn't really notice it being that crazy, but it's a deal breaker for a lot of people. Now for how much the Quest 2 costs, this is just absolutely amazing hardware. And there's a reason it took over the VR market. Yeah, I must say, it feels really good. It's nice and light and the Halo strap's amazing. The FOV is good. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I guess that explains why I have over a thousand hours in it, but yeah. Okay, now we can jump into Half-Life Alex on the Quest 2. Wow. It just looks so incredible with the resolution. The screen door effect is just a thing of the past now. Again, when you look far away, maybe a little bit, but you just don't even think about a screen door effect, especially up close. It's just non-existent. Yeah, the resolution just looks absolutely insane. That's a, what I'm really noticing. Gosh, this is still the most detailed VR game I've played. It's just amazing. It was just so far ahead of its time. The Quest 2 feels really light on my head as well. It's just such a tiny device. But yeah, if I put like the controllers underneath my leg, you won't be able to track them. But you don't do that too much. And in this game, you don't really need it. You just need to reach behind your back every now and then. But yeah, the resolution just looks incredible, I have to say. It's estimated over 14.8 million Quest 2 units sold, which makes it the most successful VR product ever created. When the Quest 2 came out, it was just so far ahead of everything else on the market. There wasn't even competition. It was basically the 
the cheapest and best VR headset in almost every way. A lot of people I know have a Quest 2, even people that aren't gamers. I have over 1500 hours on mine and I'm sure I'll look back on those one day with lots of nostalgia. The Quest 2 was well received by the public, except for the forced Facebook accounts. To say that the community were mad about that would be an understatement. This era of VR reminds me of watching thrill seeker videos before my engineering classes and being obsessed with Boneworks. Reminds me of some really good times. Hello and welcome to Tuesday Newsday. Zuck then did this weird presentation about the metaverse, which used to be a cool concept, but this completely killed it. It just felt so tone deaf and out of touch. I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. Facebook have such a bad reputation and a name change was probably a good idea. It's easy to make fun of Mark, but I must acknowledge his vision for the metaverse. As he dared to conceive it, most companies just stick to repetitive patterns. The forthcoming emergence of the metaverse is a testament to his innovative approach. I love this presentation where they're all avatars, but where are the waifus and furries, Mark? Where are the waifus? Then we got the Oculus Quest Pro. Previously known as Project Cambria, the entire headset was leaked by Sadly It's Bradley prior to its official release. I even made a video detailing his leaks and everything turned out to be accurate. I was using my Quest 2 for over two years and I was really excited for an upgrade. The main reason I got it was for full color pass through and the new pancake lenses. I was also extremely excited to have a headset with face tracking. It features 12 gigabytes of RAM, a Snapdragon XR2+, 55 to 75 millimeter IPD range, a 106 horizontal and 96 vertical FOV, an 1800 by 1920 per eye resolution, a 90 hertz refresh rate, full color pass through, full face tracking, and inside out tracking controllers. It feels way more premium than the Quest 2. After ripping open the packaging, we have our MetaQuest Pro. I must say after opening up, the black looks really beautiful, and it seems like a really solidly built headset. It comes with a headset, the controllers, a dock, a power adapter, and two charging cables, side light blockers, a cover for the front of the headset, a microfiber cloth, and finally styluses for the bottom of the controllers. When putting it on your head, it just feels like it's floating. The pancake lenses make a massive difference to the size of the headset. It makes for a much sleeker design. The power and volume buttons are on the side. There's also two audio jacks on each side. There was just this dangling cable here. Also a slider at the top that adjusts the space between the screen and your eyes. Okay, so I'm testing the mouth and eye tracking on the Quest Pro. If I open my mouth really wide, and if I look around in a circle, to see if it will actually follow my eyes, make some crazy faces. Oh, oh. And it seems to be tracking my eyes basically perfectly. The mouth tracking doesn't track your tongue. There also doesn't seem to be enough tracking points. The speakers did sound a lot better than the Quest 2. The spatial audio really made it feel like the audio is playing rather than coming from speakers. One of the significant things that I think about as this mission comes to a close. Having your crew leave is such a big event. Okay, now we're on the Quest Pro. Wow, after using the other headsets, it really makes you appreciate it. These controllers are just so amazing, so you can put them underneath your leg and they still track you perfectly well no matter where they are. Even behind my back, where the headset can't see. It solves that issue when the tracking would get lost when blocking the rings. You can put the controllers under your leg and it knows exactly where they are. It made Bone Lab so much better. Grabbing things from your back pocket on Quest 2 never worked 100%. Here, you can just reach down and grab. You don't have to think about it. Grabbing things from above your shoulders also works much better. I always thought that was just so cool. Even the menu feels really snappy. It's just like boom, boom, boom. And yeah, it's, see, it's so good just having full color pass through back. And I've really noticed the lenses are just so much better. The reason I'm not facing there is because my desk is really messy. <laughs> and the AR feels really good. Why don't we try putting down the controllers? Yeah, and we can just track our hand. And it just, it just feels so much snappier than the Quest 2 and the other headsets I've tried. I guess it's got a snappier price as well. Yeah, the hand tracking feels really good. It sort of knows without getting confused. It's the, yeah, it's pretty good. Let's jump into some Quest Pro games. This is this really cool AR painting game and it sort of transforms your apartment into a painting studio. So if we grab this, we can do a J. I swear AR's gotten a lot better on the Quest Pro. You can really now sort of tell things are locked more in position. Where dark blue. 
Alright, well, let's get a brush. And then we'll get some white. Because I wanted to make a... We're going to need a bigger brush than that. This one looks good. How's that? Not very good. Oh, there is one thing I can draw. You know this guy from Rage Comics? I got experimenting using my Quest Pro as a camera. You can capture some pretty cool mixed reality videos this way. The microphone and speakers sound way better. One of my favorite games ever and the best game on Quest in my opinion. I got a good reminder when using it why it's my daily driver. The lenses are amazing and the sweet spot is so good. I prefer the Quest Pro to any other VR headset I own. Wow. Okay. I can't notice any artifacting. Oh, oh, I can notice a little bit of compression in the distance, but Meta have really perfected streaming, I think. Wow. Just having complete tracking and being fully wireless is just such a good feeling. Oh, it's one of our units. This game looks so good. Wow. I'm noticing the headset's really starting to hurt on my forehead. Um, I can loosen it. The Quest Pro strap isn't the most comfortable, but I mean, neither are any of the other Oculus headset straps. The colors are just popping, I must say. Wow. It just, it genuinely looks so good. And the screen door effect is just a thing of the past. It is gone. Even when you're looking at a distance, maybe you can notice it. I, I mean, the resolution could be better, but from a distance, it's fine. Maybe I only say that because I haven't used a headset with a higher resolution. I'll be looking back on this one day, like, what was I thinking? The resolution was tiny on the Quest Pro. Oh, peanuts, well, you can steal a drink bottle. Oh, no. Wow. I mean, this just looks amazing. I can tell as well, I have almost no eye strain. On things like the DK2, after a couple of minutes, it was just hurting. But now it's not really hurting. It's just that normal VR eye strain. Not the... I found there's this point in VR where if you play for over an hour, the eye strain starts going away. Yeah, it looks really good. And as well, I can... It's cool, I can grab something and then behind myself, move left and right. Whereas on the other inside out tracking ones, it just wouldn't work. Yeah, this is pretty incredible. Jack and Liv. You can really see technology's come a long way. The lenses were so much clearer. The sweet spot was much higher and the controllers finally caught up to the original Rift. You can put them below your legs and around you and they would work perfectly. I loved the charging dock. The resolution was the one thing holding the headset back. It was also kind of uncomfortable. It would leave a red mark on your head if you'd been playing for a while because there was no top strap. The controllers don't just work. Sometimes you have to reboot them and they glitch out. It was mocked by critics on its release. It was considered overpriced and out of touch with the VR market. It was an absolute joy going through all of the headsets. You can see the evolution of VR from the DK1, which was extremely limited, to the Quest Pro, which is a full standalone headset and really tiny and thin. Take care. And uh, here's my fridge. <laughs>